Excellent. So good afternoon to our in-person audience and welcome to those joining us online. My name is Jean-Paul Lulier and I'm a senior research economist here at the Cleveland Fed and a member of the bank's Center for Inflation Research. We're very pleased to hold this panel featuring two very distinguished policymakers, Loretta Mester and Philip Lane. Dr. Loretta Mester is the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. In this capacity, she participates at the Federal Open Market Committee that formulates U.S. monetary policy, and she oversees more than 1,000 employees at the Cleveland Fed. Prior to joining the Cleveland Fed, Dr. Master served as an executive vice president and director of research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. Dr. Master is also an adjunct professor of finance at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, an expert in central banking, financial institutions, and financial intermediation, among many other areas. Dr. Master has an extensive publication record in the most prestigious professional journals of the economics profession. Loretta, thank you so much for hosting and participating in this event. Dr. Philip Lane is a member of the executive board of the European Central Bank and is chief economist. Prior to this position, Dr. Lane served as the governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. Earlier in his career, Dr. Lane was appointed the Watley Professor of Political Economy at Trinity College Dublin, an expert in international macroeconomics, European monetary economics, financial globalization, and the Irish economy. He has been a member of numerous committees, has published in top economic journals, and was an academic consultant for organizations such as the IMF, the BIS, and the World Bank, among many others. In 2015, he received the Royal Irish Academy Gold Medal in the Social Sciences. Thank you for joining us today, Philip. Our panel today will be moderated by Steve Leisman, senior economics reporter for the cable financial television channel CNBC. At CNBC, Mr. Leesman reports on macroeconomic news, including monetary policy and commenting on major economic indicators. Prior to joining CNBC, Mr. Leesman worked at the Wall Street Journal and the Moscow Times. He won an Emmy for his coverage of the financial crisis. Steve, thank you for being us, with us this afternoon. Okay, so for our in-person audience, we will have an opportunity to ask questions as the panel progresses. If you're in the virtual audience, please submit your questions in the chat feature so that they can be part of the Q&A. To clarify, that means, obviously, you, you would need to register so that you can be part of the Zoom room. You cannot do this on the live uh, stream. Uh, and with that, I'll turn over the floor to Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Thanks to the Cleveland Fed for having me. Um, I've known uh, Loretta Mester and Philip Lane for quite a while. In fact, this morning I said to Philip, uh, when we first met, you had small kids. And he said, yeah, senior and sophomore in college and freshman. Right. Right. Senior and freshman in college. The trouble I thought of, though, is that since you send them to the University of Dublin, you have no idea about the inflation that's taking place in college uh, prices here in the, in the States. But we'll get to that in a second. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? They have these, like, anyway. Um, and I just graduated my youngest, so I'm keenly aware. Um, thank you very much. Um, let me start with uh, Loretta uh, on this, President Mester. Um, give us an idea of how you're thinking about the conflict between growth and bringing down inflation. Um, I guess the question that people are interested in most is, what's your tolerance for pain in the fight against inflation when it comes to the economy? Yeah, I mean, inflation is really unacceptably high in the U.S., and I would say globally. And that is job one for us, is to get inflation on a sustainable downward path to 2%. Now, to do that, we're moderating demand by raising interest rates. And we're going to, you know, if you looked at our SEP, which was summary of economic projections that were released last week, you'll see that we're still going to be raising interest rates, holding them there, and then inflation will moderate because demand moderates. So growth will be, real growth will be below trend, right? The median path does not have a recession, but it does have quite a bit of slowdown in growth. The unemployment rate goes up, um, uh, and inflation then moves back down. So at this point, right, we, price stability is still job one here. We have to get that underway because it's very important to achieve price stability if you want to maintain healthy labor market conditions over time. So we're in a period now where we've got to focus on the inflation side 
as we get closer and as inflation moves back down, then those decisions become judgments about, okay, you know, do, when do you hold, how long do you hold, when do you move things back down? But right now, the focus is on making sure that we can achieve price stability. I'm gonna come back with a bunch of questions I have about that, but I wanna make sure that everybody, either side of the Atlantic gets, gets equal time here. Um, I could say, uh, Philip, you don't have to worry about the growth side of the equation, but that's not strictly true. So, I mean, I think we have a different situation because the en energy shock is so big in, in Europe that the, you know, all of the, the, the growth slowdown discussion, most of that is coming from the fact that uh, households have lost a lot of real income. Um, the, the your area economy collectively, because we import most of our energy, is losing about four percentage points of, of income to the rest of the world. I mean, the US obviously is on the other side of that to some extent. Other uh, energy producers are on, on the other side of that. So collectively, there's a very big income drop in Europe. Uh, for firms now, if you're in an energy intensive sector, uh, the longer energy prices are high, the more you look forward, especially in relation to gas, and say, well, you know, this is not necessarily going to improve anytime soon. Uh, there's obviously going to be a hit. There is a hit uh, to those sectors. So, you know, the slowdown, uh, we think the European economy is going to stall uh, later this year and the start of next year. And of course, the difference between stagnation and going into uh, some kind of mild recession you know, is, is marginal. <coughs> That's mostly coming, as I say, from, from the war, the, the shock to, to, to the energy markets. But, but as Loretta said, we've also seen uh, a pretty big jump in the yield curve this year. Uh, there is going to be, uh, as this transmits uh, to the whole financial system, uh, there will be a dampening of demand from monetary policy. But this is, a, again, in communication at least, uh, there's a very big difference between moving away from super supportive monetary policy, where the policy rate is still below neutral. Uh, you know, directionally, it's, it's, a, it's a withdrawal of demand, and we have to you know, really own that, if you like. So this is how we make our contribution to bringing inflation back towards targets. But, but, there's, but the communication-wise, we also have to say, we know there's a big recessionary force here, and we know that recessionary force on its own is disinflationary, because no matter where the loss in income, the loss in domestic demand is coming from, it will be adding mm -hmm. slack to the economy, reducing the incentives to raise prices, reducing the incentives for wage inflation. So the recession, we will fully integrate in our calibration, uh, but on top of that, we do think uh, we're not gonna have 2% uh, inflation in a timely manner unless we do have a, a kind of a normalization phase of monetary policy. If I could just underscore the differences here, your aim is neutral and your aim is restrictive. Uh, did I get that no, wrong, Philip? Uh, correct. No, but what I'm saying is, <laughs> at this point in time, we're clearly still below neutral. So we're, we're not definitely not taking a stand about whether neutral is enough. So we're keeping an open mind about whether neutral is enough or more. But what we're saying is at this point in time, in relation to, to the uh, n n next number of meetings, we're still in the campaign of going from below neutral towards neutral. Then, then uh, but this perfect and total willingness uh, to, to go wherever we need to go uh, to, to bring inflation down. Um, but, but it's just in terms of the timeline. I mean, you would have had this discussion earlier on. We're, we're just at an earlier phase in this. And because of the fact we do have this kind of independent recessionary force in Europe from the, from the shock in the energy markets, that will be relevant for, for the extent and duration of, of the monetary policy uh, adjustments we need to make. Really, your aim is restrictive, and you've sort of passed through the neutral ain't going to do it phase. Yeah, because I think we're in different situations, sure. as Philip pointed out. So in our, in our country, right, we still have pretty good fundamental demand factors, right? We know that in the labor market, demand is well over the supply. And we know that in many businesses, they still say, we, we're trying to hire workers, right? So we're in a different spot. Inflation is well above goal, right? I mean, it's 40-year highs. Um, we've brought the funds rate up to arguably a little below neutral now. But as you can see from the SEP, the committee believes that we're going to have to go above that and hold interest rates, real rates positive for a time, 
right, to get that downward trajectory in inflation and to re-anchor, make sure that inflation expectations stay anchored. So a very subtle difference between um, you and the chairman who called, he said, we're now maybe at the lower end of restrictive. Yeah. And you think we're still below neutral. I don't want to make a point, but in terms of if you, you know, have two things going off at an angle, you end up in widely different places, even yeah. if the beginning angle is very small. So, I mean, you think that we need to get up to uh, is, 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 are you in line with the median at four and a half? I'm a little above budget? the median because right. I think inflation will be a little more persistent than the median in the SCP. But we got to realize that these are forecasts, right? We, we parse the data as it comes in and the economic information that we get from our directors <clears throat> and business contacts. And then we make decisions about where we think the appropriate path is. So I'm a little bit above the median path next year. Um, because no, no, I see more persistence in the inflation path than the median in that SCP. No offense, but have you looked at your, not your track record, but the Fed's track record in predicting its own funds rate? It's not a really good record. Yeah. Well, but I would also submit that going further out on the horizon is not, is, you know, the error bands, error which bands. we publish. Uh, we put errors around, Fair error enough. bands around there. So, um, but I think people understand the exercise, right? This is our best estimate at the time, given what we know, given our models, given what we perceive is going on in the economy of where we think Fair enough. the funds rate needs to be to get us back to our policy goals. If you're wrong, where do you see the risk? Well, the risks you know, are changing over time as we get the funds rate up. Right, right now, I, I, I'm balancing the risk of, you know, I think the, the way people put it is, what is the risk, or is the more is the more salient risk that you're going to go too far, or is the more salient risk are you not going to go far enough on the funds rate? And right now, given the persistence in inflation, given that longer-term inflation expectations are, I would say, at the top of the range of what's consistent with two percent, I still am putting a little more weight on, you know, we have to make sure we do enough mm -hmm. as the funds rate goes up and as demand moderates and potentially supply actually improves. That can happen too. Both things are adjusting, right? Then I expect and I hope that my view will change and my concerns will flip because that does mean that inflation is coming back down. Okay. Philip, um, sort of a micro and a macro <clears throat> question. I'll ask the first part. Um, Germany this morning talking about fuel subsidies. How do you process that? The, uh, you had talked earlier about um, energy being a sort of break on the economy, a disinflationary break. When governments come in and subsidize that energy, isn't, doesn't that counteract the disinflationary aspects of the energy increase? So obviously, when you drill into all of these different policies, you really, it's a lot of work, so we, we have a lot of staff working on this, because, because there's a rate, under that general category, there's a lot going on. So, so one type of policy is essentially an income transfer uh, to, uh, well, sometimes to lower income groups, in other cases, a bit more universal. Right. Um, how that affects the, the inflation process can, can be worked out from the typical fiscal policy analysis. And I, I made some comments earlier this week about uh, if it's redistribution towards those are suffering the most, which are the lower income groups who have a very high expenditure share on energy and food, uh, that could be, in principle, could be tax financed. It doesn't have to be deficit financed. But if we have wider deficits, we do know that adds to medium term inflation pressure. But of course, the, the, you know, uh, a very interesting debate, it's a live debate, is let's say you pick policies which essentially cap or moderate the, the consumer price of energy. So you might say, well, okay, you, you've uh, reduced inflation momentum because the measured inflation rate comes down. And in turn, if you have any kind of backward looking dynamic in how expectations get formed, uh, maybe there's something in that. So I mean, I think hmm. th that, that's a valid channel. On the other hand, we also collectively, as you're, we need to uh, consume less energy. The, we need the price signal to work. And so if you have a a dilution of the price signal by, by essentially uh, capping uh, prices, that's collectively dangerous. And I, I'll come back to this basic point, which is individual countries might say, well, I can do this. And they take the price of energy uh, as, and demand for energy is maybe uh, a collective action issue. 
but collectively for Europe, we, we would be better off by having uh, measures that do uh, make sure that the demand, demand for energy, which is sky high expensive now, does come down. So, uh, I mean, I think it's possible uh, to design policies which can uh, basically navigate between those. Um, but essentially, it would be a mistake to, to eliminate the price signal. Interesting. And, and just so folks know, I know, um, I know, having done this for a while, how much monetary policy officials love answering fiscal side questions. Uh, which brings me to a question to you, Loretta, which is, um, um, Thanks. yeah, yeah. Um, there is a school of thinking that the Fed ought to have addressed the huge fiscal impulses that came from both administrations and that it was a failure to do that that in part led to um, some of the inflation we have today. Is there a lesson that we've learned on how the monetary side should react to the fiscal side? Was not a, a moment missed there where that should have perhaps been a pivot? I mean, if you look at our inflation forecasts, um, they've all moved up. You know, the SEP is a good example, yeah. right? They moved up over time. So arguably, right, we missed on the inflation, right? You go back, you know, last year when it started moving up in April, right? We attribute it mainly to supply shocks. I think the Fed and other economists and business people you talk to didn't think those supply constraints would be um, long lasting. It turned out that that wasn't true, that they lasted long and rolling supply shocks, right? Mm -hmm. Perpetuated inflation. So. We got the inflation um, persistence and the magnitude of the increase wrong, right? And so we recognized that at the end of last year and then started bringing interest rates up. In terms of, if you go back in, in terms of the fiscal policy, we do incorporate the fiscal environment into our models when we're thinking about, you know, how strong is demand? How strong is, you know, what's going on in the supply side to the extent that there's investment um, subsidies and some of the fiscal packages. So it's embedded in sort of our, our forecasting and our models. Um, it's not that we ignore what's going on in the fiscal side, but then, and then we say, okay, if this is our forecast for the economy, where does policy, have, monetary policy have to be to achieve our goals? But I grant you that we missed on the inflation forecast and that was part of, you know, the pivot. But was it, good, Philip. So, so, I mean, uh, this may be true in the US to a degree, but when we go back to pandemic fiscal policies, I think it's important to remember a lot of these were essentially uh, balance sheet policies. So there are big transfers, I mean, the transfers to households in America, but transfers to firms in, in Europe, which basically meant that firms, the amount of defaults, insolvencies, uh, financial distress from the pandemic was minimized. So then you ask, well, how do we think about uh, much stronger balance sheets for firms, for banks, and for households coming out of the pandemic. And of course, the, these balance sheets do, do matter in terms of maybe uh, uh, expenditure dynamics, but they matter more in terms of resilience, probably. So in terms of the ability of, so what I would say coming to the European context is households did a lot of forced saving in the pandemic. It was not massively because of fiscal transfers in Europe, but basically, you know, going back to a lack of consumption opportunities. Um, but this, what it means is this year, even though the energy shock is really big, and even though going forward we think that's going to lead to a pretty big slowdown, there has been a big cushioning of the, of the uh, shock this year because of the fact uh, firms and households did, did have stronger balance sheets than might have been expected. So I, mean, I think that mechanism, uh, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, talking about and thinking about, you know, what, uh, how much do the excess savings is, is sure. you know, uh, protecting consumption at the moment. Um, but I would say in the European context, uh, maybe one of the big messages from, from this year is uh, definitely it remained the case uh, all through last year, the start of this year. I remember Europe was locked down last winter. You know, Q4 last year, Q1 this year, there's still a lot of locking down of the European economy. There was not a huge amount of consumption activity not a huge amount of investment activity. Um, it's only now in the last six months that the demand side is really starting to emerge. So we do think now 
with the reopening of the European economy, uh, demand, whether it's uh, f from uh, personal income, but also from uh, fiscal deficits, is now contributing to the inflation dynamic. And that's one of the reasons why monetary policy is more active now than it was you know, nine months ago. You're saying uh, Americans found a way to spend even when they were locked down in a way the Europeans couldn't. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you look at the consumption yeah. dynamic. It's quite remarkable because Americans is, found quite, a way to do it no matter what. They didn't care if they well, were Well, I mean, I think the, 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 the protection of income was probably bigger here than, right. than anywhere. But, I, but yeah. I agree with Philip in the sense sure. that, right, what perpetuates, what's the difference between a relative price shock, which we saw in the pandemic, like the supply chain, yeah. and why is it getting embedded in broadly into inflation? It's because, right, that demand is being supported by um, fiscal policy, but also accommodate the monetary policy, right? So that's why we're working on the demand, using our tools to try to bring inflation down. It's, it's now become broad-based. Right. It's not just relative price changes. This is now across. And the excess savings are still out there. And the excess the savings state. are still out there. Yeah. But you, in general. just to be clear, Loretta, you don't turn around and say, we should have gone back and, 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 and next time something like this. Because when I look at the history of a tell the tape, mm. If you were doing it again like the great financial crisis, yeah. when the Fed was the only game in town and you were waiting for Godot for the fiscal side to come along, which never really came along, then you'd have to do what you did. Mm -hmm. In this case, everybody was kind of surprised. The fiscal side got its act together uh, bipartisan, in a bipartisan way, came to the fore with fiscal spending. In that sense, I mean, you don't look back and say, we should have reacted faster to the fiscal side and either eased back policy or went neutral more quickly. So I agree in hindsight, we, yeah. can, we can make that right. claim. But I think people forget the beginning of the pandemic and how there was some complete uncertainty about what was really gonna come to pass. And if you go back and look at those forecasts, right, that were being made about how dire situation we were in, Right? It's very reasonable that policy reacted where, the way it did. I think your point is that when the economy reopened, right. Right, then we should have recognized sooner right, that one, given the, the impetus from both monetary policy and fiscal policy, that there was a potential for inflation that was being driven by relative prices to get embedded and you know, get more broad base. So I agree with that. I want to add to this discussion just quickly by saying there was an economist who reminded me that at the beginning of the pandemic, we were talking about how close to the Great Depression unemployment rates we were going to be. And that just never happened. Right. Well, yeah. unemployment went up quite a bit. But the thing that was remarkable but, about the pandemic yeah, is that it came, came back down. down so quickly. Philip, let me turn, turn to you. Um, you guys have this uh, thing called uh, TPI? Transmission Protection Instrument? Correct. Yes. Let's end this right now that I got that right. That's the only thing. Because <laughs> you guys spit out the abbreviations faster than I can keep up. Um, under what circumstances can you talk about, would you envision that being used? So, um, concept Maybe I should explain what it is. Do people know what it is? Is, is a, It's something that is, is a, an instrument you can use to make interest rates in the euro area more similar. For it to, it to, to um, uh, enhance the uh, efficacy of monetary policy. How's that? Do you that right? Let me offer uh, maybe a kind of complimentary description. Um, so all central banks, and we talked about this a bit this morning, uh, yeah. um, do, do have a kind of a market functioning role. So we, we had uh, in March 2020, very clear dynamics in the bond market and money markets, where it's clear the central bank, we had to do it, the Fed had to do it, Bank of England steps in, and it works. For, once you step in and, and you stabilize, everything can stabilize pretty quickly once the central bank steps in, and the Bank of England has had to do that the last few days. So every, every monetary area will have a central bank function like that. What we have is we now, I now start calling the area 20 member countries. Croatia's you know, coming in at the 1st of January, so I'll say 20. We have 20 member countries now in the euro area. And uh, with, with 20 different uh, sovereigns, 20 different uh, financial systems, and a common currency, I mean, we've known uh, forever, but we've had many examples now 
where uh, you can have a dysfunction, a, a panic, an overshoot, which takes the form of basically running out of a, one country or a cluster of countries to two other countries. Because simply, you know, you, you can run without taking any currency risk, which is, you know, historically mm -hmm. has been a, a kind of barrier to, to kind of speculation is. So intrinsically in a monetary union with 20 sovereigns and 20 financial systems, there, there is a, in principle, a vulnerability to, to uh, speculative attacks. So the TPI is essentially saying, if we see a situation, not that the, uh, uh, necessarily that, 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 that there's a widening of interest rates, but, but there's a dysfunctional element, there's an overshooting element, there's a, there's a volatility element there. Uh, in principle, the central bank can play a stabilizing role there. So it, it's a very, uh, I think, important that we have this, um, but it's also true, and what we said in, in our announcement is essentially, um, this cannot be boiled down to a formula, a fixed formula. Uh, it's going to re require the judgment of the governing council uh, in order to work out those situations where this would be relevant. But we, we, you know, I think uh, we can all imagine scenarios where that can happen. It's just the nature of financial systems. There is a fragility there. Uh, and it, there's a unique fragility for a monetary union because of this. Um, uh, 20, the fact you have 20 financial systems and one, one, one money. Um, I, I do want to stick with this a, a bit because um, I, I guess the two questions I have coming off of it is, is there an historical analog where you could imagine it might have been used in the first instance? And it sounded like you were saying it was not so much about monetary policy transmission as systemic risk. Is that the thing that you're most concerned about? Did but I get I mean, that wrong? <laughs> It, it's the interconnection, really, because, of course, um, if we have a transmission mechanism that's broken because bond markets are haywire, it's, it's difficult uh, to run monetary policy. Right, right. So especially when you have a monetary policy campaign, which we do, which is to normalize monetary policy, we, we need to know that we can do this uh, at the speed we want to do it in a safe way. So let me... Uh, I think it's important in terms of histories, analogies, and so on. The Euro area is 20 years older. Um, there's a sequence to the Euro area. Uh, when it started, the institutional architecture was, to say the least, incomplete. And over time, uh, we've seen the Euro area build new institutions. For, for example, the ESM, uh, the, the fiscal treaties, a banking union. Uh, and for us, there was a, a very big innovation 10 years ago with OMT. And that had a particular role in the evolution of the ECB in the area. And this is, I think, an important additional uh, uh, tool in our, in our toolbox. So the TPI, I do think, helps to complete the architecture of monetary policy for the ECB. So you know, I think okay. it's, it's, it's important. But the most important role, of course, uh, is the, the question was being asked, you know, is the ECB capable of, of addressing this problem. And we've designed, I think, in, in a very nice way, a very coherent way. Um, and it's very important to do this ex ante when there's no immediate issue, to have an ex ante, well-designed tool that, uh, I know the market would love to know every detail, but you know, we have to- 3%, uh, <laughs> right? We, we, have, we have to retain the, the judgment about, uh, are we seeing dysfunction, are we seeing, uh, the situation where we think it would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I think it's, it was a very important innovation. Um, I, I'm just a couple minutes away, I'm gonna start taking questions from the audience and, and online. I just wanna come back where I told Loretta I'd come back to, which is, um, I asked the same question of the chairman. I, I mentioned your, your response. Um, would a recession stay your hand in terms of raising interest rates? Well, I mean, again, we've got to get to price stability, so we're going to do what we have to do to get to price stability. So, no, and if you look at the SEP, right, you'll see there's a growth recession in terms of growth in that SEP, the median path is quite low. My own forecast is that it's going to be quite low. Uh, real growth will be well under trend. And, and that's going to feel bad, right, because we came from a, an economy that was growing at 5.5%. And now we're going to be slowing down to mm -hmm. well below 
trend growth, so well below 2% growth. So that's going to feel, we're going to feel that, you know, and I think the chair uses, it's going to be painful. That's the kind of pain, right? Unemployment is going to go up. But it's necessary in order to avoid having even higher costs later on if we don't mm -hmm. do what it takes now to get to, to price stability. So again, uh, the same question that I asked the chair for, for you, uh, Loretta, which is, given long and variable lags, is there a reason to get to a rate that is perhaps in the lower end of restrictive and give policy time to sort of look and see what impact it's having? So I pause. think that's in the SCP. I mean, we're getting policy up to where we think it's somewhat restrictive. And in the SCP, we hold it there, right, next okay. year. And then, that, and we're not raising rates until inflation gets down to 2%. That's important, right? I think. There's a perception maybe that we're going to keep raising until inflation gets down to 2%. No, per precisely what you're saying is that it does take some time for policy to work itself through the real economy. So the argument is not over a pause, it's the point at which you pause is where exactly. the, the debate would be. No, exactly. And, and we'll, we'll get to that point and have that discussion, right? I, that's what I meant. I mean, I'm kind yeah. of hopeful that we get to that discussion sooner rather than later because that actually means inflation has begun to move down in an appreciable way. I'm going to open the floor to questions and uh, also uh, if there are additional questions, we'll address them. I see two and, oh, there's Krishna, Krishna Gua. Um, but let me do, let me do the, uh, the floor here if you have questions. I'm not seeing any at the moment. I'll come back to that. So do, is there one? In the back there. Yes, please. Um, hi, uh, I have a question for, for Philip. Um, you know, by not specifying too much uh, the criteria when you're going to intervene in, in terms of TPI, um, aren't you to some extent encouraging moral hazard uh, you know, in the, in the, in, on the other side of, of, of you know, the fiscal side in the European Union? Okay, so, so, I mean, I, I've seen and read and heard this observation. So let me make uh, two points about this. One, we did publish the criteria that essentially there's a whole set of uh, uh, criteria about conforming to the European framework, policy framework. That's a very big safeguard against moral hazard. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of uh, criteria there, which um, I, I, think, and I think you need to also remember this is written as essentially a standing instrument. So if someone says, well, the escape clause is still active right now, yes, but that, that's only for the next budget round. There will be a European fiscal framework which will be more constraining uh, pretty soon. Even now with the escape clause, I mean, there's also the discipline, you know, uh, I think it's absolutely the case. Uh, European governments are mindful about the, the disciplining role of bond markets, and we are not going to take that away because uh, in a functioning bond market, there will be orderly differentiation across European governments. And you see it. I mean, there's pretty big uh, differences in financing. The announcement of TPI did not lead to the collapse of spreads in Europe. So I, I, so I think this uh, concern, I think, is um, uh, misplaced. And then the second element is we are clear, and we've tried to be as clear as we could in the description. This is about uh, disorderly adjustment. It's about basically a multiple equilibrium problem. Mm -hmm. It's not saying uh, we, we offer a price cap on European sovereigns. So uh, I'm not seeing the moral hazard uh, in, in action. And I would say also, by the way, uh, going back to what I said about sequencing, it was important that we have a tool uh, in, in basically combination with the ESM for dealing with a situation where a country basically has uh, sufficient bad fundamentals that they no longer have access to the market. And if they go to the ESM, then the ECB has a different job, which is uh, when a country goes to the ESM, uh, we offer OMT liquidity, if you like. So um, the concern about, you know, oh, you would intervene because you have no option. There is another option, which is for countries where, which are losing market uh, funding, they can go to the ESM and we have a clear role uh, with the OMT in that situation. So I think uh, if we had introduced this before ESM plus OMT, that critique would, would have uh, more substance. 
but doing it now when we do have uh, uh, the, the other program in place, as I say, it's adding to the toolbox, but it has a clear role, which is basically uh, overshooting, uh, destabilizing de this function. It's not about just a country having high interest rates. I'm going to make an assumption, President Messi, you do not want to comment on the TPI. I, I agree with everything. <laughs> we had a question in the back there. So, a uh, question for both. Um, uh, to what extent do you think that such a rapid increase in the rates pose any threat to financial stability, uh, particularly thinking about the housing market? Thanks. That's both of Just to understand, it, what I impact would a substantial or fast increase in rates have on financial stability? Right. I mean, it depends on where you're looking, right? So in the U.S., right, so far, all the indications are that our markets are functioning. We have pretty healthy banking system right now. Um, and so there is an evidence that our rate increases haven't been tolerated by the financial markets or the financial institutions in this country. So at this point, right, I don't feel that we've raised interest rates um, too, too quickly. And I think we need to get the interest rate up given where inflation is and how persistent it, it, it has been. So, so, I mean, I, I think there's a number of levels to this. One, um, we, we, we are saying that you know, we have a clear vision that we have more uh, normalization to do, but it's going to take several meetings to do it. Because I, I do think uh, not overdoing it in one, one meeting or two meetings is important. That you do signal where you're going. And all year long, we've basically done a lot of adjustment of monetary policy. And if you, I mean, it'd be interesting to a dynamic visual here going back to December 21, when basically the normalization started, and look at the movement in, in the yield curve since December, I mean, the jump is big. There's a big jump in the yield curve, but basically it's, it's been essentially now nine or 10 months of adjustment in the yield curve. Now, probably what's true is as we move the policy rates, because there are mortgages in Europe which are basically directly tied to those policy rates, uh, there's another, I think, a step adjustment now in, in the housing market. I think it, I can see it myself. So it's very important now. First of all, for us, we're, we're as predictable uh, as we can be uh, in terms of uh, predictable and understandable reactions to the data we see. But also, I think uh, all of the uh, financial stability authorities across Europe uh, are also taking care in all the ways they can. And the, in fact, the European Systemic Risk Board today has, it, has, it, has published basically this, uh, if you like, uh, reminder to, to all of the regulatory authorities that there is a job of work here. But I mean, go back and look in the last 10 years, the amount of studies about it's clear uh, there's a st financial stability risk from low for long. There's also st financial stability risk from snapback, where, where the interest rates move more quickly. But it, this has been intellectually understood for a long time. So hopefully, lots of uh, macroprudential measures, uh, much safer loan-to-value, loan-to-income ratios than they used to be, uh, lots of counter-cyclical capital buffers, systemic risk buffers. So there's a lot has been put in place, not knowing what the exact shock would be. But now we do, we do have, a, if you like, a, a situation where for the banks, you know, what we're seeing is essentially, on one hand, uh, you know, some, some parts of rising interest rates are good for banks, uh, but of course the recession risk is also something for credit risk uh, that uh, will have to be seen. But maybe in the housing market is, um, th to the extent the interest rates are an equilibrium driver of house prices, equi you know, an equilibrium adjustment in house prices is, is different to an overshooting or disorderly adjustment. So house prices falling is part of the transmission mechanism. And of course here, when inflation's at nine point something, uh, we also have to differentiate between uh, real and nominal house prices. So you, you might have this kind of uh, dynamic where we may not see outright nominal falls, or you know, maybe contained, but in re real value, of course, they might go down. 
I want to follow up with a question we have online from Krishna Guha, who writes this for Loretta, but I think both uh, uh, panelists can, can respond to this. To what extent is it appropriate for the Fed to take into account the financial conditions index tightening coming from overseas and the impact of dollar strength on the rest of the world? Well, our mandate is domestic. You know, we focus on the U.S. economy. But, of course, the U.S. economy is part of the global economy. So when we're thinking about our, our policy, our monetary policy, we can't ignore what's going on in the rest of the world. And so there's mechanisms, basically, right? We know that one of the financial conditions that tighten when we're raising interest rates, especially if we're raising them stronger or more, you know, before the rest of the world, is that our dollar strengthens. So that impacts. Um, our economy, for sure, and we take that into account. And the other mechanism is through, fin so the trade tr channel is mm -hmm. going to be affected by that. And then we're also potentially being affected by what's going on in global financial markets as well. But when we're thinking about policy, it's from the lens of the U.S. maximum employment and price stability goals, taking into account that we know that our policy impacts other countries that then feed back on our economy. I think there's also a domestic aspect to Krishna's question, which is that lost trillions of dollars of wealth in the U.S. stock market, trillions in the bond right. market. Right. There's been an extraordinary tightening there. Right. Do you expect to see that right. at least helping with inflation right. somewhat, or is that not because so much of the wealth is held by a small percentage, is that not a big impact? No, I think that does, but I think also the uncertainty that's now attuned to what's going on in the financial markets also will impact the U.S. economy. So again, it's going to be this calibration exercise going forward about demand is moderating, you got to, how much, how quickly, supply may be changing as well as we go forward, and then you calibrate policy to that. As I said, right, job one right now is to get inflation down, both demand and supply play a role in that. And the tightening of financial right. conditions, of course, is how we're moderating demand. So that calibration exercise continues as we go forward. Knowing Krishna the way I think I do, he would like to turn that question around and ask it of Philip from the euro standpoint and the weakness of the euro and the extent to which that ends up importing inflation and becoming a factor in your policy. So, I mean, I think Maury Opsfeld, he wrote a very nice piece a couple of weeks ago at the Peterson Institute. He said, Look, look, at, look at the mechanism here. I mean, the big mechanism is we all have to understand uh, the global economy. So if there's a slowdown in global demand, then the prices of commodities, which have been falling, uh, the prices of tradable goods, so a lot of the manufactured world is globally priced. All of those factors would basically be a function of global tightening. But we can all do it. We all do do it. We then feed in uh, th those global factors into our domestic models. So the question, I mean, I think the advice from, from Maury Oswald is make sure you're, you're doing that well. Make sure that you're, you're, you're fully integrating the fact when there's a global tightening cycle, the global component of inflation is going to soften. Uh, and uh, we all have our job on the domestic component. Uh, and so to me, that's it. It's the world economy uh, dynamic. It's not the mechanics of the euro dollar rate. I mean, the, uh, for two reasons. One is we are a continental sized economy. The, the exchange rate is important, but in terms of the list of factors driving European inflation, it's, it's not at a high end. And then, but maybe the most important point, because uh, sometimes uh, I, I get this point, is for monetary policy, if we raise interest rates, most of the transmission would be domestic. It'd be reducing domestic demand. The fact that it may have an effect on the exchange rate, we, we integrate that calibration. It's one channel, but we're, I don't think, we, um, let me uh, be fairly s simple here. I, I do not see situations where we would uh, adjust monetary policy just to affect the exchange rate channel. You know, it, it's just not big enough to dominate the, the, the domestic uh, components of, of, uh, of the transmission mechanism. Right. And, and sometimes I get asked, you know, do you care about the global economy? I would point people to the public documents like the, the Teal book, right, which are now some, with delay, right, five-year delay, go out. There's a whole section of the Teal book on international 
right, economy. So that feeds into the policy right. discussions at FOMC meetings. So, um, Rita, I been doing this for a long time, and, and I guess the longer I do it, the more confused I get. Um, and um, I think that's good, though. I think that's. I think if you're not confused, you're not necessarily paying attention. But um, this is a moment when understanding monetary policy is, is difficult for me in the following way. And it, some of my confusion was sort of sparked by by the speech you gave on the 26th, which I thought was an excellent speech. You talked about the U.S. economy having a huge housing deficit, supply deficit. How is raising interest rates or mortgages to 6.7% gonna help solve that housing supply problem? And let me layer on top of that, there's still something like 1.2 million people, uh, million workers short in leisure and hospitality compared to where we were. Mm -hmm. 300 something thousand teachers. How is softening the job market gonna bring back that supply? Over the time I've done monetary policy, the drift of policy has always sort of made sense for the aggregate good. I have a problem processing this in the wake of this uh, pandemic and the need to bring back supply and the effect of interest rates on supply. Well, I gotta go back and look at what I wrote in the speech because I don't think I said that, that but in any case, Right. We're, it's not going to bring back people to the, it's not gonna affect the supply side of the economy in the time frame we're talking about. There are problems, the speech, as I said, right, there are Sorry longer term yeah, well, issues longer term. in yeah. the supply, right? right? So right. even before, right, the, right. well before yeah. the pandemic, right, we weren't building enough supply to keep up with demand and prices were rising, yeah. right? But when you're setting policy, monetary policy, we know we're gonna be working through the demand side of the economy. So again, supply's constrained, it's some constrained in the labor force, it's constrained in product markets, it's constrained in house markets, right? And that's part of what started some of the inflationary pressures, right? Our policy is to moderate demand. At the same time, there could be adjustments on the supply side. It could be that people do start coming back into the more people right. come back to the work. I don't think we can count on that because I think if you look at you know, labor force participation rates, they're basically back to trend. But you know, we did see an increase mm -hmm. in labor participation last month. Maybe that'll continue and that'll help alleviate some of the pressures and the wage, wages, wage pressures. Supply chain disruptions could improve over time. So that supply will be moving as well. But the mechanism through which we're gonna get inflationary pressures it's through the demand yeah, side. It's through the demand side. Phil, do you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, it's a little bit of a hierarchy or a sequence. I mean, dealing with the structural problems all of our economies face in different ways, um, you have to have price stability first. Because as Loretta mentioned, this basic point earlier on, which is if we kind of uh, delay too long, ignore too long, and then end up having to do a much bigger tightening later on, it's, it's more destructive. But I, I would say coming back to construction, I mean, uh, what's maybe striking, and it must be true here, it's very true in Europe, is construction is a sector which has been shrinking this year, even before our policy normalization. Because one of the big inflationary dynamics has been rising uh, uh, commodity prices and input costs. So the construction materials have gone up so high. Um, so if you like, that, that's reflective probably you know, of this global supply demand mismatch. And until we do have a, a more stable inflation environment, it's, it's hard to take on the, these uh, big uh, structural problems such as un undersupply of affordable housing and green investment and everything else. Got about two minutes. A quick question here. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how quick it is, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll throw it out anyway. The, the, I think I was uh, primarily thinking this is for Loretta, but uh, um, Philip might have some comments on it as well. Uh, after the pandemic, uh, the Fed pulled out its uh, uh, large-scale asset purchase playbook again. Uh, and uh, as you know, a lot was written after the, after the financial crisis on the, um, on the effectiveness and uh, risks associated with quantitative easing. And I was wondering if uh, after the last couple of years of experience, if you have what, what additional have we learned from the quantitative easing period uh, after the pandemic uh, that we can add to our knowledge about uh, that we accumulated after the financial crisis? That's a good question. So, I mean, remember that during the pandemic, the first asset purchases we did were for financial stability reasons, were market dysfunctioning, 
right? That tre all important global treasury market. Um, we needed to go in and intervene there. And then we did use it once interest rates were at zero to add accommodation, right? So I think we learned from the great financial crisis that that was a way of adding accommodation. I think what also, we also learned from that, and that's why we were um, very um, deliberate in sort of putting out plans and walking people, and making sure everyone knew what the plan was, is that you have to communicate well in advance when you're starting to first stop purchases and then allowing things to, to, to whirl off the balance sheet, which is what we're in the process of doing now. So I think those things were what we learned. Um, perhaps it's, it's not as easy to, to wind that down. I mean, I know the Fed has been criticized. Why were you continuing to buy assets when you had already signaled that you, you, know, you thought that inflation was too high? And I think that was a case of wanting to be very forward, giving people in the markets and everyone some real forward looking, you know, we're not going to end this on a dime. And I think that was also something we learned is that we have to be a little, little even sooner to think about those communications. We have one more question. Is there time for that or uh, good? Yeah, because this is from Richard Berner, another old friend of mine. Um, and, and it really does relate to the question. Um, uh, for both Loretta and Philip, has the current inflation experience triggered a rethink of either inflation models at the central banks or the framework for the conduct of policy? I think we'll just leave the second part for another day. But, but the idea of, of, of the models, I don't know, Loretta, did the model spit back that, that inflation was transitory? Or was that a judgment that was made? Well, I think the whole conference is about models, right? right. We're th talking about right. models and innovations, right. and we learned a lot this morning. Sure. And not all the models agreed in terms of the policy prescriptions coming out of the models, but it gave us a lot of food for thought. So I'd have to answer Dick's question as yes. We are always working to rethink right. our modeling and our inflation. But, but the, 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 the models tell you it was transitory, or was that a human judgment that was made Respective no, no, no. Or, or I mean, the models, the models, you know, we have a set of shocks, right? right? We saw the shocks, and, the models and then the mo you, if the shocks right. are temporary shocks, we know what the policy prescriptions coming out of the models are. It's judgment about how persistent will they be, and recognizing that it was the accommodative monetary policy that changed those relative price shocks into something that was more persistent. Philip, just real quickly, somebody told me the mistake that was made by central bankers is they put all of their eggs in the transitory basket. Is that a rethink that needs to be done? No, I mean, so I mean, I think that these years, of course, there's going to be many uh, studies written, uh, and I'm, maybe I'll contribute as well in the future. But what I would say is going back and doing a re real, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, sure. the real time updating and so on, is there's still, uh, you know, I, I think I, I put a lot of weight on the fact the way the world unfolded uh, was not something that that you know from day zero uh, you could have predicted. So even uh, li like last year, so last year we did have uh, oil prices recovering quite a bit in, uh, in uh, uh, 2021. We did have a run up in gas prices even before the war. Yeah. You know, but, but essentially at that point, um, th there are quite a fair amount of the transitory dynamics which are proving transitory. There's a the turnaround in the global supply bottom. Yes, it's going more slowly than initially thought, but it's happening. The easing of, of congestion uh, in that sense. The pandemic reopening, I think, uh, it remains something we will have to see. So one yeah. version is, and in the European continent, is only this spring, summer, where you're fully reopened. Because sure. we did have you know, more lockdowns last winter. So one of the big issues now is, is that a kind of one-time burst of uh, activity, a one-time reset of prices. Uh, which is essentially a transitory contribution to inflation dynamic. Uh, that story is not over yet, so let's see. So what I would say is uh, we, we've had a number of transitory shocks, uh, but we've also had this really big, in the European context, long-lasting now, gigantic. Sure. And in terms of quant quantities, the, the, the scale of the increase in gas, electricity, oil, is, and f for us as an importer, Loretta said about a feel-bad situation. Europe may grow in GDP terms, but if you hand over four percentage points more of your national of European income to the rest of the world, that's a very big loss to be shared across the European. Uh, I just you know. add to the hindsight being 2020. I got COVID 
in December 21 as part of a wave that ran from December to January when everybody said you were supposed to be hiking rates and millions were getting COVID at that time. So it wasn't exactly clear even as recently as the end of last year what should be done. So I'll just but, but maybe, see, I mean, maybe the, the, the bigger issue for us and yeah. for all, is we meet every six weeks. What's important is if you do see inflation becoming more persistent or stronger, you react and you catch up. So, so this debate, you know, um, which is, you know, I think very important because we say, oh, you're a bit late or something, or t way too late, however you want to say it. Even if you fully accept that issue, it's not the case, it's game over. Right. You know, th th there's plenty of room. You talk about long and variable lags. Uh, it's important that, what's important with this high inflation rate is we get it back down to where we want it in a timely manner. So, so we're all working hard now. So it's a little, I mean, I think, that debate needs to continue, the retrospection, the look back, the lessons learned. But it's not kind of a zero one type thing saying, well, you know, right. because at some meeting you didn't do something, that's it. We always have time to adjust. Great, let's leave it there. Thank you so much. Please join me. Thank you.